welcome to the Trenches Technology Podcast. I'm your host, Sharon Bueno, Managing Editor of Trenches Technology Magazine. This is the second episode of the TT Podcast, and we are continuing to focus on the COVID-19 health crisis and how it's impacting the trenchless industry. For us at Trenchless Technology, we are continuing to bring you the trenchless news from our homes, and we'll continue to do so until we are given the all clear. Today on the podcast, we have NASCO Executive Director Sheila Joy. Sheila will be filling us in on how COVID-19 has impacted NASCO operations and what she is hearing from its membership. So welcome, Sheila. I want to thank you for participating in our podcast. I know it's been a hectic few weeks for you and your staff, which we will fill everyone in on in a few moments. NASCO definitely has a lot going on. Um, But first off, I want to ask how you are and how your family is doing through all this. Oh, thank you, Sharon. I'm doing fine, just fine. My son is in California. My daughter is here just five miles away, but it feels like, you know, forever away because I can't really see her. So, you know, that's the hardest part, not just being with family, but um, very grateful that I'm employed, <laughs> grateful I can still work, that I'm healthy. And so I don't I don't have a lot to complain about, but thanks for asking. That's great. Um So that leads into the first question about how has COVID-19 affected NASCO's daily operations? I mean, I realize everyone today is working remotely. Here in Ohio, we've been on a lockdown since essentially mid-March, working from our homes and limited getting outside. So what is the situation where NASCO is based in Maryland? Uh, We were on lockdown about the same time period, a little bit later, the end of March. we luckily already had the infrastructure for working um, remotely because when I took over a couple of years ago, one of the first things we did was get a, a put our server on the cloud because I travel so much and so does some of our staff. So we were in good shape with the technology. Um, in fact, one of our employees, Lisa Avila, she's been working from Italy for the past year. She was employed there with her husband. And so we it's seamless to us, the technology part. I would say the one thing that I think about is the emotional health of our staff and just making sure that they're um, connected and that we all stay, you know, in good contact. One of the things I've asked them to do is really kind of focus on their passions a little bit while we're not together. One person is working on learning how to speak uh, Russian. Another is investigating what she might do in the future with a Dalmatian rescue. And so I just think it's really positive to work with your staff to keep them focused on other things besides everything we have at hand. Some of our employees also have every morning, they have a little uh, coffee. They get get together. They get together for coffee in the morning before work hours. Um, We've had pizza parties and, you know, our regular staff meetings focusing on our core values. So the technology, not a problem. The work, we're getting it done. The thing that I really focus on mostly is just the emotional health and well-being of our staff. Yeah, the technology is wonderful for the video chatting. That's a we've been using it as well at BMI for video meetings and such. It keeps us in touch with our coworkers definitely. But that also leads into another question about NASCO. You guys are known for your training classes throughout the country, throughout North America, really, um, throughout. Every week, there's some kind of class regarding PACP, LACP, and the like. So how has all this impacted how those training classes are being done? I've seen some pictures online that you're doing it virtually. Yes, we've created virtual classrooms. And Sharon, I like to consider it what I call a God thing. You know, this is a very unfortunate time for people, and especially those who have the virus and have passed away. It's 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 um, obviously devastating. But usually through things like this, there's sometimes come positives. And getting our PACP and ITCP training online just was something that had to happen very quickly. The need arose and it just all came together. Our staff was all hands on deck for about a week and a half. And the the way that it just came together and we got those virtual classrooms, the policy written, you know, we've got communications with our trainers. We originally decided just to do this for those classes that were um, going to be canceled because of COVID-19 and the inability to get groups of people together. We max out the classes at 10 people because it is done on the Zoom platform. And we want to maintain that ability for people to learn from each other and to have you know better connection. 
So we've limited the class size to 10 maximum. They're still trainer led, the trainers, it's very personal. But the beta test, for lack of a better way to describe it, has been so incredibly successful that we are now this week looking at how to extend both ITCP and PACP so that we can start creating new classes that were not um, you know, impacted by COVID-19. So we see this as an extension of our learning. And it's really a great time, uh, Sharon, because people are at home. You know, if they're thinking about getting PACP certified or ITC, ITCP certified, it's just a great time uh, to make that happen. So it's working out wonderfully. So the response from the people taking the classes has been more than you thought or? We recently just created an online survey. We've always had one for our traditional classrooms, but we just launched one for students who have become certified uh, via our virtual classrooms. And so it'll be interesting to see how those um, mm -hmm. survey results come back. I personally have not had any complaints, um, nor has our staff. So I think we would have heard if there were significant problems, but um, I am anxious to see what the students think about it. The EPA in Homeland Security came out really early designating water and wastewater infrastructure work as critical and essential. What are your thoughts about that and how important was that designation to be made to be made? You know, it's it's really a super simple um, answer. <laughs> Everyone is being told to wash their hands repeatedly. You can't wash your hands without clean water and you can't really be healthy if you can't dispose of that dirty water appropriately. So um, clearly that's a, a very important um, piece to this whole puzzle. But drilling down a little bit more to what our members do in terms of the contractor community, that statement was very impactful because clearly the water and wastewater sector workers are essential. But that document and that letter from the EPA to the governors also identified the manufacturers and suppliers of equipment and materials needed as being essential. So NASCO has a large percentage of members, maybe, I'm gonna say maybe 15% who fall within that category. So it also protects those companies and services to make sure that, that there's everything available to, you know, to get the work done properly. So what are you hearing from your members about how COVID-19 has impacted them? What kind of questions are you fielding from them? I realize you had created a special web page for them, um, kind of like a COVID-19 resource page. So what, what are you hearing from them? To be quite honest, I probably had one or two um, inquiries, and that was very, very early on about what they needed to know in terms of getting out there and still doing their contracting work and how we could support them. But luckily we have two excellent resources and I feel like we've done a pretty good job of pushing out information, which may explain why we're not getting a little, a lot of incoming inquiries. But um, our legal counsel um, has really done a great job of keeping me informed of any labor employment um, type of issues or resources um, for companies and organizations to work with. Um, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act being one of them. Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act um, for Employer Payroll Tax Deferral. Um, and those are two of the documents that are on our COVID-19 resource page. And then our government consultant, or excuse me, government relations consultant, Steve Dye, he was actually quite instrumental, I believe, in getting that EPA letter put together based on his close connection and continual communication with the EPA. And so that was that was clearly a very important one. And also the Homeland Security's identification of critical infrastructure, which included underground infrastructure was another big uh, resource. So we also are turning to other organizations, WEF being a great one. They have a beautiful resource page that we link to from our um, COVID-19 page on masco.org. So that is something that will continue to develop, evolve. There's nothing too pretty when you go to that website, but there's a lot of good information, including um, the very first thing that we did was turn to our health and safety committee within NASCO to get a recommendation from them. So that document is there as well. Um, but this will continue to um, evolve you know, as, as, as time goes on. So. Now, NASCO, you were supposed to have your annual convention. It was this month, I think. If I'm getting the dates right, I'm not quite sure. Obviously, that's not going to happen. You can't physically be in the same 
place. You get a lot of people there. So you told me a little bit about your plans, maybe do something special for that so you can still get together. Yes, uh, per our bylaws, we still need to have an annual meeting. And also per our bylaws, we can do that virtually. So we are going to go on as planned with our annual meeting for members next Thursday. Hmm. Uh, it will be via Zoom, a webinar, not a meeting, but we will hopefully have a lot of people show up because we need a quorum to vote on a couple of important issues. Um, but our theme has changed from Scottsdale 2020 to strong and steady in 2020. <laughs> and so one of the things that we're really focusing on is consistency, keeping things as normal as possible. You know, it's really hard. We, we talked about pushing out the meeting to maybe next fall. But to be quite honest, Sharon, I think the last thing that's going to come back for all of us are large groups of people. Mm -hmm. And so we are just, you know, kind of pausing any of our event planning. And we're staying the course, strong and steady. One of the things that we're doing is we have asked all of our committee chairs and co-chairs to maintain their current positions for another year. They do an awful lot of work with education, um, developing technical resources, and then, of course, advocacy. And that's the engine of NASCO's accomplishments. And so to keep those leaders in place for another year and to really keep moving forward, uh, we think is the best, you know, just to really dig in, keep moving and staying strong and, and staying steady, we think is the best approach. So, you know, we, we're just going to pause all the other events and really focus on on how to keep our members supported consistently. Well, it sounds like NASCO, it's business as usual for NASCO. Even during these unusual times, you guys have a ton of stuff on your plate. We do. <laughs> We've never worked so hard, I swear to you. It's just crazy. Um, <laughs> but it's all good. <laughs> I want to thank Sheila for joining me on the podcast today. Until next time, I hope everyone stays safe and is well. And we'll be back soon. Thank you, Sharon. And I really hope through all of this, our industry continues to unify and stay strong and stay steady. And, um, you know, we see light. And I think it's going to be really beneficial for all of us. So thank you for this opportunity. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Take care.